Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, we're going to continue our study. Um, well, actually, not continue anything tonight. We're going to. Uh, recently, I was in Tennessee, and I appreciate so much all the help and the support in getting there. Uh, and I preached a message up there, and Joel wanted me to uh, to do it here. So if y'all don't like it, <laughs> check with Joel. <laughs> All right, uh, take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. The theme of the conference in, um, um, in uh, La Follette, Tennessee, there we go, we'll get that out. Now that I've said that, I probably won't have to forget it again. But in La Follette, Tennessee, was about this passage, and it was about the ones, and how significant that one is to the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 4. All right, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and praise the lord he's in you all let's pray father we are so grateful for the truth of your word and to be able to come and to have a time of fellowship where we study and focus on what your word say says and as we think specifically tonight about the one hope of our calling Lord, we just pray that it will be significant to us and it will help us in our walk, our daily life, in ministering and uh, meeting the needs of others. And we'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, as we read this passage, I'm sure one of the things that really jumps out at us is just the word one. And we think about one, it, it's, it's really important to the body of Christ. Uh, sometimes the comparison is made that one applies to the body of Christ. And in contrast to the nation of Israel, which the number 12 is identified with the nation of Israel. But there's some real significant meaning in, in the way that Paul uses it. And so we look at there, we got the one Lord, the one faith, and the one baptism. We have one body, one spirit, one hope. Uh, and, uh, and then we have the one God and Father of all. But the one hope of our calling. And as we look at this, we come along and we see once again, and it's all about, once again, our walk. And when we think of walk, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy. Uh, if Paul is beseeching us to walk worthy, it is clearly evident that there's a way not to walk worthy. And, uh, and when Paul is dealing with us, there's only a couple of times when Paul really goes after believers who, who are walking in a way that is uh, like the unsaved. He talks a little bit in Romans chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But what he's talking about to, specifically to believers is that we walk worthy, and it's going to be based on doctrine which is consistent with the dispensation of grace in the church, the body of Christ. And it, it's the one. Our walk, it represents our, our manner of life. I mean, we think about walk, and what is life but a steady progression of putting one foot uh, kind of like uh, in front of the other. I thought tonight we would get uh, Sherry to demonstrate uh, that for us. Uh, and I could, I could do it too. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking uh, the other day how funny would it be for Sherry and I to end a three-legged race together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gwen could be on, on my side and uh, Al could be on Sherry's side. Because, uh, but it is the steady progression through life. And it's good to know, isn't it, that, that, that God is, is good and clear about what makes a worthy walk. And a lot of times when we think about worthy walk, we look in verse 2. And verse 2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now, he's just getting to the point, and, and our worthy walk goes beyond verse 2. But this is where it starts. It starts with the right attitude, the right state of mind. It says, with lowliness 
and long, uh, with meek lowliness, meekness with long suffering and uh, forbearing one another in love. And we wonder sometimes, why should it be so difficult for believers that Paul needs to say that we need to forbear one another? Well, have you ever noticed that every one of us is different? That we all have different personalities, we have different interests, we have different likes, and there are things that we go. And, and sometimes the, our differences, they can be a, a rub. But as Paul talks about the worthiness of our walk, it starts out with lowliness. We need to have the proper opinion of, of ourselves because that's where it starts. And we need to recognize that as a believer, we have two natures. We have the old nature. We have the new man, old man, new man. We have the flesh. We have the spirit. And uh, uh, as we uh, read in Galatians, and yet they are contrary one to the other. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Why? Because they're contrary one to the other. And many, many times, if not most times, the difficulties in relationships inside of a local church doesn't come from the new creature that we are in Christ, but it comes from the old nature, the old man. The new creature, the one that was created by the Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. And there's nothing wrong with his workmanship. When we fail, when we, when we don't choose to use our free will to walk in the Spirit, then that's not God's fault. That's a, that's a choice that we used our free will to make. But when we come to the idea of what do we think of ourselves, and the new man never has a problem with humility. The new man and the new creature has a perfect understanding of who he is and, uh, and why he is what he is. So we come along, we've got lowliness. And come with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 3, and 3 to 5. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, when we talk about measure, a lot of times we think about it's a limiting quantity. Well, how much milk do we put in this recipe? Or how many eggs do we put? And we go and we measure the exact quantities. When we talk about God giving to every man the measure of faith, it's a boundless measure. It's exactly everything. There is no restrictions. He does not hold anything back at all. We have been given, and every single one of us has been given, and this is going to tie into the ones of Ephesians 4. He has given the same amount of grace to every man. There are no second-class citizens in the church, the body of Christ. There are no second-class believers. We all have an exact equal standing before God as one, uh, as, uh, as any, any other believer in there. So it says in verse 4, for as, many, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now, isn't that different? Then he goes and he says, but, you know, uh, our standing is equal. But in the early part of the church, uh, the body of Christ, before the completed revelation of God's word, there was the issue of gifts. Now, the issue of gifts was uh, something that was necessary at the time because they didn't have completed word of God. And so God gifted men uh, with an ability that they did not have on their own to know what to do and how to answer and how to teach and how to live. But in, in, when we come back to we're members one of another, uh, we need to recognize that uh, there are no favorites with God. Uh, it, it would, it's hard for us to uh, think about sometimes. You know, the Apostle Paul is not loved by the Lord any more than we are loved by the Lord. Because he, it's the same love. We are one in that re, re, uh, regard. So verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ. God has a tremendous, well thought out plan for how to organize and for the church, the body of Christ to function. And it's where everybody is equal. 
where there's neither Jew nor Greek, where there's neither bond nor free, where there's neither male nor female. Why? Because we're all one in Christ. Now, you're not in Christ. That's not true. But when you get into Christ, it becomes an absolute truth. God doesn't look at us and say, okay, men are going to have a special place. He's not going to say, oh, well, no, we're not going to have men be special. We're going to have women be special. We're not going to have the, the, the slavery and the bonds be, be different because it's just not true. And uh, we're all one in Christ. Now, that's an attitude sometimes, not an attitude. It's an understanding because what is the favorite part? If you will come back to Ephesians chapter 4. What is the favorite part of these, this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 4? You know, we get, out of the first, uh, we get out of the first few verses, and what really begins to resonate with us is in verse uh, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and so forth. We think, we, and, and, and it's true, this are the, very necessary that we understand this. This is truth that, that uh, establishes a believer in the dispensation of grace. But we, for, we want to understand these passages and apply these passages, these verses, with, uh, without taking into account the first three verses. And the first three verses is really what the Apostle Paul wants us to get and to have this mindset about the, the unity and the perfectness of, of one. I remember uh, a song from the 70s, and it was sung by a group called Three Dog Night. Anybody remember Three Dog Night? How can everybody in here know Three Dog Night? <laughs> but they sang a song, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one because it becomes the loneliest number. And, uh, and I think, boy, that was a depressed group, wasn't it? I loved the song back then, but now I think about it. I said, you know, they're talking about a three-dog night. These guys are upset because they're so cold they need four dogs or five dogs. All we got are three dogs. I saw everybody's foot tapping, by the way, as we were talking about those words there. And I would say, I don't know them, and of course, this is far-reaching to make this uh, apply here. But they certainly didn't know about the church, the body of Christ, and the unity here, and the, not the loneliness of one, but the perfection of one, the all-encompassing of one, that we together are one member in the body of Christ. Now, I like that because um, we don't have to figure out who's number two. You know, once again, there's, there, there's no second-class citizens. What can you do with the, number of, uh, with the number one without destroying the unity or the, the example that one brings forth? You'd have to divide it into something less than one. And that would defeat the purpose in our understanding of what, uh, of what we have today uh, in the body of Christ. And one body, and when we think about that, that that's a good thing. You know, we trusted Christ as our Savior. We don't have to wonder, where, where were we going? Where was God going to send us? You uh, go to work for some employers today, and you wonder, well, where am I going to be sent? Or if you join the military, you're going to wonder, where am I going to be sent? Well, to, in the, today, in the church, the body of Christ, we're all sent right into the body, and we're all there in one place together. And, and, and that's why the walk that we've been called to, come back to Ephesians chapter 4, over there, and uh, take verse 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, we focus a lot of time on the fact that we don't have to create the unity of the Spirit. But you know, there is some importance put on how we think about endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. When we endeavor to do something, there is absolutely, there means there's effort. There means there's planning. Uh, have you ever gone out to endeavor to do something, but you didn't make the best of plans and you didn't get there? I mean, there's something to it. And there's not only the effort that's put into it, there's always the risk that you aren't going to make it. But God has, for us, 
an absolute victory program in grace. And if we will follow his design and follow his program and follow his word, we will be victorious. We will not fail because this is God's design. This is what, it, and on one side of our mind, we're thinking, yeah, well, that's hard to do. How can I, how can I, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit with some of these people, you know, that's difficult, impossible. And on that side of our mind, it would be. But when we have the mind of Christ, when we are focusing on what Christ would do and how he would do it and how he is enabled us to do it, there is no question at all. It will work. Does anyone really believe in their heart that God does not have the ability to empower the believer to be everything that he wants the believer to be? So what is the real answer to this? Is to get out of the way. Somebody said it at our Wednesday Bible study today. Just let God do it. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. We don't have to do it. We have to quit trying to do it. Because we, and, uh, some people think that uh, not doing it means they're going to stay home, sit on the sidelines, and do nothing. And that's, that's not what the teaching of, of it says at all. You know, when Paul talks about in verse 2, Forbearing one another in love. We had a good discussion on this today somewhat about the, how important love is. And, and love gets such a bad rap. It's a, uh, and it mostly comes from the world and the way people view world, which is through fleshly eyes and not through the eyes of the new creature that we are. And we view love and we say forbearing one another in love. And we just sit back and we think, you know, everything is love, love, love. See, I was tapping your foot again. That's another song, wasn't it? But what we want to do is remember that this is not that type of love. This is the love. This is agape. This is the love not only that God loves us with, but empowers us as a member of Christ's body to be able to love one another with. The difficulty, and this is kind of where we were talking uh, in uh, at Bible study today at lunch. It's not the problem most often is not me loving you or you, you know, in that regard, or even you loving me. It, the real question is allowing you to really love me and you really allowing me to love you because that, that takes it to a different level. That means we have a certain level of intimacy and a certain level of exposure and any time, you know, what, is the, the, what we want to do is we want to protect ourselves. We don't want to be hurt. We don't want to, to uh, suffer disappointment uh, in that. And we're always afraid if somebody really, really knew me, when's it going to come out and they're going to use it against me? And so, and, but in agape love, agape love is not based on that at all. And the new man, if we understand that now, the new man will never, ever take advantage of the love that comes from someone else or the love that someone receives from us. And that's a different way of thinking. Now, do I know how to flip that switch on and off? No. Do I believe it can be? Absolutely. But it comes from our allowing the Holy Spirit to do in our lives that which only the Holy Spirit can do. And all it requires from us is that willing mental assent to let him do it. Because you think if we are willing and, and that's, our, that's the desire to be able to set aside the, the carnal, fleshly desires of the way that our old man thinks, that the Holy Spirit's not going to show up. But here's the other thing. People don't often realize our responsibility. Where is the, that empowerment going to come from? And you can get up and you can pray for it every single day. But it's a prayer that's already been answered. And it's a prayer and a provision that God has already provided for. He doesn't have to get up today. Ephesians 1.3 says that we've been blessed, have been blessed, past tense. Everything's been done with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So God doesn't have to get up and to do something specifically for you because he's done it for everyone already. And to me, that is, a, that is a great blessing. So we think about this and we look at this love 
And it's a special, sweet kind of love. Come to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll read verses 3 through 5. It says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, speaketh uh, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. That's a good thing, isn't it? You know, I can tell when I'm having a bad day. I'm having evil thoughts. That guy just cut me off. Or that guy blew his horn. I mean, the light just this second turned green, and he's already blowing his horn. <laughs> now, I know it's a fleshly response, but I sit there another five seconds. I don't, I don't go. I sit there, and then I pull off real slow. Now, then I want to pull him over and say, did you know Jesus loves you? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's all about our thinking. And it's all about our believing that God will be able to provide what he says that he will provide. And to have the ministry of the Holy Spirit is something that God has provided us with. And I know we don't, don't think about the Holy Spirit as much as we, uh, as we should or could. We think about God a lot. We think about the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise, the, praise both of them and honor both of them. But the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, and he is part of the spiritual blessings. You know who is not your Bible teacher? God is not your Bible teacher. You know who else isn't your Bible teacher? The Lord Jesus Christ is not your Bible teacher. But you know who your Bible teacher is? The Holy Spirit is your Bible teacher. And where, what position and what things could we put ourselves in that would then allow the Holy Spirit to teach us? It's in the book. And it's going to be through study. And uh, so we think about that and we put it in there. So we come along and we think about uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Come back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I think about, I know we've talked about it already, but I think about endeavoring. And usually, and this is going to be the tricky part, there is a part of our mental makeup that will get out there and endeavor. And that's our flesh. You know, the flesh has a bent both to do good and evil, but it's got that bent to do good. That's why religion flourishes today. Because they're there teaching them how to empower their flesh. Anybody that would read Romans chapter 7 and see how the Apostle Paul struggled with once he became uh, uh, under the law again, under the commandment. And he came under the commandment. He says, and that which I thought was to be life was, was death unto me. He says, I thought I was going to live and it slew me. And he was talking about taking a thou shall not commandment and using it to empower and to clean up his flesh. And anytime we think we can control our flesh with our flesh, that's a mistake. And that's something that is going to cost us in our peaceful walk with the Lord and our unity of relationship in the, in the body of Christ at large, but specifically... Uh, as it relates to the church, the body of Christ, uh, locally. So, you know, we come along, we take a look, and we see endeavoring will not happen without effort. But we need to be mindful of the influence that could happen on the flesh. In, verse, in, a, in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 3, Ephesians 4, verse 3, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, if I have a choice in life, it's to seek out peace. 
It's, uh, it is to be at peace. And we are at peace with the Lord even if we don't feel like it because he's declared peace on us. But it's to be in peace and in harmony because a church can really flourish when we are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If every single one in a local church would endeavor to keep the unity that's already been established, it's already there, it's available for us, it's never taken away from us, but endeavoring to keep the unity in the bond of peace. You know what makes it a successful endeavor? It's the bond. Now, who are you going to bond to? Well, members of our, of our local church and our local church family. The moment we trust Christ as our Savior, and we say, I think we said this on Wednesday, but I, I think it's a fantastic thing. You know, we just wonder about timing. But we know that, that we've been translated, that the Holy Spirit translated out of Satan's kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son. How long does that take? <laughs> Faster than that. I say in the very moment that we trust Christ as our Savior, in that instant, in the same instant that in our mind we're giving that mental assent that I'm going to believe that Christ died for my sins, in that unmeasurable moment of time, God the Holy Spirit grabs us and in that same moment of time baptizes us into his body, the Christ body, and then he seals us. It's not, okay, well, I put him in the body today, and I'll come back and seal him up sometime later. I mean, you know, it happens so fast, Satan didn't even recognize that you're gone. You know, gone like right now, in this instant of time. <laughs> Thank you. And so we look at that, and we say, well, praise the Lord, here we come. We've got it, then. You know, if we're going to have anybody on our team at all, I would like for it to be the Godhead. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I, I believe in my heart they're qualified to do everything we need to do. But it says in verse 4, there is one body. So when we trusted Christ as our Savior, we're not scattered all over. We're in one body, one location. And there's one spirit. We don't have to wonder, well... Who is going to empower me? Who is going to work on God's, uh, on, on God's behalf to us? It's going to be His Spirit, and there's only one. We don't have to hunt it down, study it out. We just have to believe it. Even as your call, though, in one hope of your calling. What do you think about your calling? Well, most of the time, people think about their calling. Well, I... and. Uh, you know, we might would want to talk with someone, but somebody said, well, God called me to do this, or God called me to do that. You know, I love the example that uh, Pastor Jordan uses out of Chicago. And he says, you know, he takes, he draws this great big circle up on a board. And he says, inside this circle is everything that God is doing. He says, if you want to be in God's will... Find out what God's doing and just do that. Aren't you glad that God didn't call everybody to do the same thing? But we have one hope of our calling. Every believer has a, an, an expectation of God being fair and equitable in his dealing with us. And our calling is to walk worthy. And we can walk worthy, if you will, on those believers. As a believer... In the body of Christ, there's only one hope. When we think about the church, the body of Christ, though, we'll say, well, what about uh, our blessed hope? Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's a hope. It's part of our one hope. You know, it's just, it, it's given to us. It's part of the spiritual blessings. You don't take it and dissect it out there because everything that God is doing is it, and it's one purpose. And what is the purpose of the church, the body of Christ? It is to exalt his son. 
and when, and when the catching away comes, when the rapture, as we refer to it, takes place, there's going to be a time when God the Father puts every person that ever trusted Christ in the dispensation of grace of God, and he puts them out there on display for the fallen angels, the angelic creation, for the angels that didn't fall, and for every other believer to see these are the people that honored Christ in the, most, in the best possible way that they could. They trusted him with their life. And God's going to say, I exalt my son, and, and these people were believing that. And it's to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will go on throughout eternity, throughout the ages, as we go out in time and eternity. It's something that will never grow old. And, uh, and that's what God has desires for us. But, and so I'm glad that your hope and my hope are the same. Because if I thought, or if you thought, I think I'll say y'all. If y'all thought for a minute my hope was better than your hope, we'd be out of arm wrestling for it, wouldn't we? And, but that's not, that's not it. God's not going to do it that way. And so it's equal, and he has equal love for all. But here's in the dispensation of grace, and you could probably, I th no, I would say this is something that would be true for all men of all ages. God doesn't love the believer any more than he loves the unbeliever. Now, in our mind, we say, well, wait a minute. I've trusted Christ as my Savior, sure. But you know who he sent, who he sent to die on the cross, or who Christ came to die on the cross for? Sinners. <laughs> he came to come to Romans chapter 5. He came, he came to sinners and, uh, so that we could be believers. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. We'll read down to verse 8. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, when we were without strength, there was absolutely nothing that we could do. We had no power to change God's opinion of us. And it was when we were at our weakest that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now here's what man would think, and this is how it works out in human thinking. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Now that's true, isn't it? But that's limited, even for good people. <laughs> You know, one of the best examples, you know, long live the king, you won't go. People who go and sacrifice themselves for our country and the freedoms and the rights that we ha have, and we appreciate that. But there is a different motivation than what is being expressed here. He says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many times, if you shared the gospel with many people over the years, you've come across somebody who said to you, I can't trust Christ as my Savior right now because I'm not ready yet. Well, we would think they're not ready. What do you mean, not ready for eternal life? You're not ready for what? No, I've got to clean my flesh up. I've got to stop all these fleshly activities. And when I get to a certain part of a uh, uh, level of cleanness, God will be happy with me, and then he will save me. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, sir. Speak up, though, so you can hear the mic. And the sad news, Lewis, and, and yeah. that's right. No one's perfect, and God didn't die for perfect people. He died for sinners. And, and the good news, or the bad news, someone saying, I love the Lord. You can love the Lord and be cast alive into the lake of fire where you'll burn for eternity. Because the gospel is not that I love the Lord. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. 
How that Christ died for our sins. That's the good news. You can love the Lord, and I know many people do. They don't have a relationship with him, but they love the Lord none, nonetheless. And this love can, that we have here, uh, that uh, we see the example of how man's love works and how God's love works, and this love can barely, uh, clearly be seen and understood only in light of Calvary, only in light of what God has done for us. And uh, even when we were dead, Ephesians chapter 2 says, that even when we were dead in sins, have you ever seen a dead man do very much? I love my dad. I did, and he did a lot while he was alive. But once he died, he didn't do anything else. Not for me, not for you, not for anyone else. He did what dead people do. And now, we're, we're dead in trespasses and sins, but we're out here walking around. It takes a spiritual understanding of how God's program works. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a, there's a great goal, if you will, of how believers need to understand and, uh, and what takes place once we trust Christ as our Savior and the purpose of our salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, if we weren't all dead, how could Christ die for all? See, we're, we're all dead. We're all dead in trespasses and sins. And this is a verse that tells us there was nobody that wasn't in the mind of God when he had his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, put to death on Calvary. Because Christ died for all. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22 says, That it's unto all and upon all them that believe. If you think you're going to get to take part of this, if you don't believe what God said about his son, you're going to be sadly mistaken. But listen to this in verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him which died for them and rose again. Yeah, without being, you know, in... We want to balance out our understanding of the commands and all that Paul puts in and the encouragement that he puts in his uh, writings and forget about legalistic, being legalistic, Com and forget about it being a law that's demanded. But this is something that we should do. Romans chapter 6 says that we should walk in newness of life. Can you have an argument with that? No. What should we do? We should walk in newness of life. And so he says in verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live. Now there's only, if you're dead and you live, you're only going to be living because you trusted Christ as your Savior. Should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, verse 16 and 17, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Once again, this is a very simple illustration or truth that we look at that may be, con that may be made uh, uh, difficult to understand because when it says we don't know anybody after the flesh, y'all see me up here? I see y'all out there. Are you all in your flesh? Well, you're in your body. You're in your living body. But Paul's still going to talk, and he moves into verse 17. The new creature does not know anybody after the flesh because the new creature is not flesh. He's not flesh. So he says, verse 16 and 17, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. There were people there, no doubt, that had seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And they knew him after their flesh. There were people who may not have ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, but they knew of him, but they weren't saved. They knew about the Lord Jesus Christ, but they were yet to become a believer. They're yet to become alive. They don't know Christ after the flesh anymore. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature all things are passed away. Behold, that's an exciting, powerful word. Behold, all things are become new. 
Uh, we all like getting new things. I do. Uh, I don't run through the house going, Behold, my computer's brand new. <laughs> no, because I'm there for four or five days trying to make it work. But, uh, but it's new. And it's, it's new on an, a very, very exciting level. When we realize how dead we were in trespasses and sin, and the life that we have that has been given to us by God because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and all things are new because of something that God did. Not something that we can... All we did was believe. But God did not forget anything. All things are become new. Our new creature... Is a, it's, a, it's new, it's different, not anything that we've ever uh, known or been able to take advantage of before. And it operates on a new doctrine, and it's called the newness of life. In verse 18 it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. First thing we need to recognize, when he's reconciled all things unto himself, it doesn't mean that every man's justified. It can't mean everything is justified. Because look at verse uh, 20 and 21. It says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What God did with, in his sovereignty, he, had a, he made a judicial judgment where he made the whole world savable. And the good news about the ministry of reconciliation, the next, down, coming down a little bit, it says it's the word of reconciliation. The great news about that is that it applies, again, to believer, the reconciliation, the believers and the unbeliever. It is not uncommon for believers to think that when they do something wrong, that God will get them. I heard a message one time that says God is quick to get mad and slow to get over it. That's not true. You know, that God hadn't spent any time being mad at us once we trusted Christ. He wasn't mad at us when we were sinners. But in the dispensation of grace, it says in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So who is God not punishing today? Everyone. The, the believer who begins to walk after his flesh, God is not going to take him out behind the woodshed and give him a whipping. He is not going to make his tires go flat and his air conditioner go bad or send him disease and sickness. Why? Because he's declared peace with us. That's probably easier to understand than it is to understand how he has reconciled the unbeliever to him. So when we read about world tragedy, when we read about wars and rumors of wars, when we read about sickness and disease, when we read about hurricanes and tsunamis, when we read about all those things that come on us, we know absolutely for certain that it is not God trying to get anybody's attention. God is not sending tornadoes into a neighborhood that kills a hundred people, and some of them are believers, and some of them are unbelievers. He didn't wipe out a family of believers just so he could get to those unbelievers. You know why? He's declared peace <laughs> with them. And he's declared peace with them, and all we have to do today, we have the greatest message in the world where we can take the doctrines of grace and the dispensation of grace, and we can go out and we can share with people, and we can just say simply to them, be ye reconciled to God. This doctrine of reconciliation is one of the most important uh, doctrines, I believe, in understanding of how God views the world today. Now, if God's not holding anything against us, and he's not, what could he hold against us? Well, I lied today. Now, that's a, this is not true. No, it probably is. <laughs> God's not going to hold that against me. Why? Because his son, his righteous blood, was put to my account, and he has forgiven me of all trespasses for Christ's sake. What about the unbeliever? What about the unbeliever who goes on some sort of a rampage and just harms 
Numerous people. No, God's at peace with him too. God is not going to do anything to him to get his mind. There's one thing that that, that person needs to know. He needs to be reconciled to God while it is still time, while there is still time. When we say, and be ye reconciled to God, that's not the gospel. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The, prop, the thing is, be reconciled to God. People say, I'm all in. But then you put that little thing about having to trust and to believe exclusively in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that might be a little bit too difficult for some. Because it's in our normal way of thinking, in our normal way of being, how much do we believe really comes for free? You know, there are no free lunches. There are no this, there's no that. And in our mind, uh, you know, even the TV says, if you'll buy this at this price, we'll send you another one exactly like this one, absolutely free. All you have to pay is additional shipping and handling. I didn't free. <laughs> That's extra. But the world views free differently than what God views free. When God views free, he, he says, this is, he holds his son out to be. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. He holds his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. There's never been any stronger believer in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ than his father. God says, you know, I can overlook sin, I can forbear sin, because I know that there's a day coming when my son will go to Calvary and he will be crucified and he will die. But he also believed in the resurrection. None of those sins, none of our sins would have been paid for if the Lord Jesus Christ was not resurrected from the dead. We look at the Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. And if you think you can pay for it by confessing your sin or by giving money or by donating your time or committing your life to the Lord or asking Jesus to come into your heart, if you think you can pay for sin that way, you've missed the point. The point is, only thing that pays for sin is death. We're already dead. We can't pay for that sin. The only one that could pay for the sin was the Lord Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Such a clear message. If we want to live, it's going to be because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we look and we see and we have such a wonderful uh, doctrine of reconciliation. And I think it's absolutely great news, positive news, fantastic news, to be able to tell a believer, or an unbeliever I should say, who is struggling with living in a sin-cursed world, in a body that's not redeemed. It's a sin-cursed body, racked with sin, disease, that it didn't come from God. That God is not mad at him, that God loves him. That's our message today. God loved you enough to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We think about part of the one hope of our calling. The one hope of our calling is to understand this. To understand this is the message. To understand that our walk should be based on doctrine and not on our understanding of doctrine and not on hearsay. But it's something that we know, we've read, we believed in God's word, and it will, and use it to affect the quality of our walk. The great hope of the believer, though, is the catching away. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. And here's a solemn warning in Paul's writings. But I would not have you to be ignorant. 
Now, there's a lot of opportunity for people who don't mean to be ignorant, but they are ignorant. I might use a different word when we're talking to them to explain to them that they're unlearned, that they're uneducated. There's some things about God's Word that they've yet to clearly understand. But he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, there's a right to sorrow. If you know somebody who's died in their sins, they're dead and they have no hope. They can't change it. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. For this, verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You know, it's going to be an all call when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And, uh, and, and everyone's going to go at once because of this, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall, de shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But there's more to this blessed hope than just going to heaven to be with the Lord. What has going to heaven to be with the Lord, what has it delivered us from? Come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. No, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, and we read, <coughs> verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort ye yourselves together, edify one another, even as ye also do. Well, what have we been delivered from? the wrath of God during the tribulation period. Verse 1, he says, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When Paul, when Paul talks and calls it the day of the Lord, what is he talking about? He's talking about the 70th week of Daniel. He's talking about the times of Jacob's trouble. He's talking about the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon all man but specifically the nation of Israel, during the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation. Tribulation is broken in half. The tribulation and the great tribulation. Do you think tribulation is anything other than wrath? The only thing difference in the first half and the second half is the intensity of the wrath increases. And it will increase until the Lord Jesus Christ himself comes, not to catch the believers in the air, as our chart would show, but to come all the way down and place his feet on the Mount of Olives, exactly in the spot where he was when he left, to go back into, when he went into exile, after his resurrection. But it says in, in verse, uh, verse um, 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Where do you read the terms and where do you read about the day of the Lord? You read it in prophecy. Paul talks about the day of the Lord, in a certain, but it's a different context, but he also calls it the day of Christ. He says, but ye, verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day and are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be some, and, uh, sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, of, and the, helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now, the bigger question, the bigger understanding is, today believers are in the body of Christ. 
And in the body of Christ, we are inseparable from him. There's no getting in the body and out of the body. You can't get out of the body. That's why eternal, eternal life is eternal. You can't get out. God's not going to kick you out. You can't fight your way out. But we're there. We're in the body of Christ. And for God, the church, the body of Christ, has to go before the tribulation can begin. Because it would ultimately be God punishing his son again for something that he has already paid for. He ain't going to do it. For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our, by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another with what? The doctrine of being delivered from the wrath to come. Edify one another, even as also ye do. The pre-trib rapture of the church, the body of Christ, has been under a massive attack for many, many years. And that's sad because it was a truth that was all but lost in the late 18, uh, in, up to, uh, towards the late 1800s. And people began to see, well, wait a minute. The church isn't going through the tribulation period. They're going to be delivered from that period of time. And the only way to be delivered from the wrath is to go before it starts. But I don't know if it's just that people don't... Maybe we, It was talked about all the time in the early 1900s. Perhaps we don't talk about it. But the biggest thing people don't do is they don't rightly divide the word of truth. There, is, there are people that have, but I don't understand how you can be uh, one who understands the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and still place the church, the body of Christ, somewhere in the tribulation. It doesn't fit and it's not going to work. Well, that is part of our hope and part of our blessing and part of the things that we, that we work for. Come back, if you will, to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll just end with the reading of verses 1. First Thessalonians, I mean Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll read the first six verses. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you ye walk worthy of the vocation with, wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Perhaps the greater meaning, as we come down through verses 4 and 5 and 6, is to the extent that we don't believe and preach and teach the ones will have a direct effect on our ability to endeavor to keep the unity and will affect our walk and will affect the rewards that we receive as based on our faithful service at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. We love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in your sovereignty and in your omniscience that you understand completely the needs for every age that you've had man live through and specifically how to thrive and to flourish in the dispensation of grace. We just pray that we will endeavor to have that relationship with your son that gives us the power and the ability to walk worthy that will give us the ability to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Father, we give you the praise and glory for that, and we ask and pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.